everyone, and welcome to our training Thursday with the Stoplight Customer Success Team. My name's Cheryl, and I'm going to be joined with my colleague, Amy. Together, the two of us will be your hosts for today's training session. So as we get started, we're going to uh, turn off our cameras so that you can focus on the presentation and not our faces. All right. So just a few notes about the logistics of the webinar. First, if you have any questions during the presentation today, we uh, please feel free to ask them in the QA window. We have people monitoring those windows and they'll respond to your questions as asked. And at the conclusion of the webinar, we will post all uh, questions and answers in our Stoplight community in Discord. Second, then Amy is going to uh, do a tour of the workspace interface. And then I will be posting some documentation links in the chat window. So we invite you to click on those and bookmark them for reference for later. And the documentation will also help you uh, understand a little bit better about that feature and how to implement it as you build out your workspace. So if you have questions, we ask that you um, please ask them in the Q&A to minimize confusion for all of the participants. Finally, for those watching the recorded version of the training session, you can find the posted links in the video description below. And if you have any questions while viewing the recording, you're welcome to join us and ask those questions in the Stoplight community in Discord and use the training tag to post your questions. The purpose of today's training is to review some of the key concepts at stop, of Stoplight and walk through an overview of the Stoplight work, uh, workspace interface. I will be starting our session today with a quick overview of the Stoplight platform that can assist you and your organization as your API development needs. And from there, we will review a few key concepts that will help us navigate the platform. And then Amy's going to introduce the Stoplight workspace interface and review the features and the settings. So let's take a look at some key concepts of Stoplight that can help you and your organization enhance your API development process. Stoplight's API design features allow you to develop quality APIs with a collaborative approach to an API design first philosophy. It helps create and prototype your APIs using our intuitive visual editor for open API specifications. You can create your APIs in line with industry best practices. Also, with the release of discussions, members can add comments, ask questions, and interact with your interfa uh, studio interface. Discussions also integrates with popular task tools like JIRA and Slack to help facilitate collaboration outside of your workspace as well. With Stoplight's API mocking features, you can instantly create a mock version of your API based on your open API specifications. This allows you to visualize and get feedback on your API designs before spending time on your backend development. API mocking also allows your front end client application developers and back end service development teams to develop in parallel. Within Stoplight's API documentation features, you can provide a top notch developer experience for internal and external consumers through automatically generated documentation based on your open API files. This will help internal and external users discover, learn, and integrate with your APIs quickly by publishing interactive API documentation, tutorials, and code samples that are always up to date. And finally, Stoplight's governance uh, feature allows you to govern your APIs at scale with an always in sync central repository of API designs, schemas, and API documentation. You can easily share and apply and enforce standards across all of your API designs to provide consistency, reusability, and better governance throughout your API program. You can utilize Stoplight's public style guides to leverage sets of curated API design rules from top companies around security as well as design themes. And using the proposals feature, you can see the recent API changes at a glance to keep track 
of changes across your Get Connected projects. Now that we have reviewed the stoplight, uh, how stoplight can enhance your uh, API dev development process, let's take a minute to review some key concepts and understand within stoplight. The first concept to understand within stoplight is roles. While workspace roles are focused on access for managing settings and changing those at a, a workspace level, which are in your members tab, projects and teams are, are roles that are focused on level of access within an individual project. So I'm not going to dive into the specific descriptions and permissions for each of these workspace and project roles at this time, but we would recommend that you take a look at the documentation, become familiar with those roles by um, by clicking on those documentation links. All right, second concept is we're gonna look at groups and teams. So groups provides a way to organize projects for easy navigation and maintenance. For example, you have the ability to separate and uh, the public projects from the internal projects. And you can also uh, separate like documentation projects from API projects. On the Teams, this feature allows you to manage user access to projects. So it allows organization to easily manage uh, users to have access to stoplight projects as well as controlling project permissions. And this also simplifies the process of allowing users to collaborate on projects while giving administrators more security access control over access controls. So finally, let's look at the hierarchy within the stoplight of the two main user interfaces that you'll encounter. Within stoplight, you have your workspace and your studio interface. Your hierarchy begins with your workspace. Within your workspace, you will establish a look and feel as, as well as setting up integrations with your Git repos and your single sign-on options. And you will also create and manage your members and projects within the workspace interface. So as we uh, then as members begin to navigate through the different groups and into individual projects, they will see the docs view of each project. And in the docs view, a member can learn more about each project based on the members granted rights within each project. So they may move then into editing that selected project. So this will transform them from the workspace into the studio interface. So within a scope of a single project in studio, you may have one or many API designs and open API specifications, endpoints, models, models and schemas, documentation articles, and applied style guides. And within style guides project, you will have the ability to create and manage rules and functions for your own style guide. Within your transition then between your individual stoplight projects, you will navigate back to studio and then back to the workspace where you can select a new project and head back into studio to edit specific artifacts associated with that project. So your technical team and your API design arch architects will likely spend most of their time uh, in the studio user interface. Today, we'll be focusing on the workspace user interface and how your owners and admins can configure the look and feel of your workspace. So uh, now that we understand the, uh, how Stoplight can help you with your API designs and how to navigate through it, I will hand it over to Amy, who will walk us through the tour of the uh, workspace interface and show us how owners and admins will interact. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, so for the next 40 minutes or so, we're going to cover a lot of information and where I would like to begin is by looking at our workspace from a pre authenticated view so you can see I haven't yet signed into my workspace. And there's three things I just want to point out as we're looking at um, our workspace from a public view. First, obviously, is our landing page. This is something that you can customize. Um, it's a way to greet people, introduce them to your workspace, um, let them know maybe what's new, what's coming, what you're working on, how to interact within your workspace. So that's something that we'll look at in the settings tab on how we can customize that, but I wanted you to see that here. The other thing I want you to notice is that we've got a couple projects that are visible without having logged into the workspace. 
So Cheryl mentioned that we can set up our, our projects to be public. So if we have a public project, then anyone has the ability to um, view the articles and documentation associated with that project. So we can see the articles listed here, and we can even delve into the, the different APIs that are associated with this article right from a public view. And then the third thing I want to look at really quick is our sign in options. So I just wanted you to see what this looks like. We have the ability to configure this and how we want to allow users to authenticate into our workspace. And we'll do that in the integration section of the settings tab. So we'll look more into that in a little bit. But I just wanted you to, to be able to see those so that you understand as we talk about them a little bit in the settings tab what that's going to look like. So now let's look at our workspace that we have logged into. So here you can see I'm logged in. Um, and just a little bit about my workspace. This is um, our sandbox workspace. Um, I am an owner of this workspace and it is in a professional plan. So if you're following along in your own workspace, which I would encourage you to do, you may see some differences and those are just based on either a plan difference or the fact that I am the owner of this workspace and maybe you aren't an owner of your workspace. But you'll be able to see all of the different functions and settings from my screen and understand what they do and how to use them moving forward. So there's three different areas we're going to look at today. We're going to start by looking at the tabs along the top here. We'll go through each one of those and what's what's in them. And then we're going to look at some of our quick access actions here on the left hand side. And we'll wrap up our day by looking at um, our flyout menu and some of the information that's in there. So let's get started. First is our homepage. You'll notice this looks very much like the page that we saw before we had authenticated into our workspace. And that's because it is. Um, so when you create your landing page, um, just keep in mind that it is visible potentially to the public. So if you have internal links and stuff like that, those will not work. Um, but it, again, it's a great way to invite um, users into your workspace, how to navigate through, what to be aware of within your workspace and stuff like that. And we'll see how to configure that again in the settings tab. So now let's look at our projects tab. So this will be a list of all of our groups and projects. We have the ability to filter our list based on visibility of each project if we need to do that. We can also search for a project by name if we would like to. We also have the ability to order our project list um, by clicking on the headers of each one of the columns here. So if you're looking for something, um, you can flip those a little bit and see some information. So now, as we look at this, we'll see that we have groups in here as well as projects. So projects that aren't grouped together inside of a group, you'll see those um, individually listed here. And then the groups you'll see with the little file folder icon next to them. So if we cl click on a group, what will happen is we'll see the group overview panel will open up on the right hand side of our screen. That's just going to give us some information about this group. Um, so we've got our group name. We can see how many projects are associated with this group, how many group admins there are. Um, if we click on the admins, we can learn more about the admins that are associated. Based on rights, we might be able to change the visibility of this group. And then again, based on rights, um, we may have the ability to update the settings of this group. So change the group name or description, something like that. We can do that right from here. Now, if we do a similar thing by clicking on a specific project, you'll notice we still have an overview tab, but it's a little bit different. So this is going to give us an overview of the project itself. So here we can see our project name. We have the ability right from here to click on the edit button, which will take us directly over into Studio where we can begin to update or add to any of the artifacts associated with this project. We also have the ability to view the docs. So the same way we saw before we had logged in, when we clicked on a project, we saw that docs view. This would take us right into that docs view just right here within our window. And then again, based on rights, we have the ability to um, update the settings of this project. So we can click on that and update any settings, see the different um, branches or versions of this project, um, all from that overview panel here. We'll also see below that the teams that are associated with this API project. We have the ability to look at different versions or branches if there are any. And we also will see the different artifacts that are associated with this project. And then if we click on the members tab, here we have the ability to invite a team or a member to this specific project. 
We again, based on our rights, may have the ability to update the visibility of this, pro of this project. So is it public or is it internal or private? We can see, again, the two teams that are associated with this project and their, the team roles within the project. So we've got editors and then a viewers team. And then we can see each individual member of the project and their rights within the project as well. So as we're looking at our project, we also have the ability to view some information as we scroll along the different row here for each one of our projects. And a couple of the icons I wanna point out is you've got right from here, you have the edit in studio. So this would um, take you again, right into studio, the same that we'd see here, the edit button in our overview tab. So if you wanna work on this project specifically, you can click right in here and that will take you right over to, um, to studio to be able to make changes. Again, you can go right to your docs. So the same as we see here with our view docs, you can click on this and that would take you right to the docs view. And then next to that is our pin button. So this allows us to pin or unpin a project from our pinned project sidebar here. Um, this is something that is done individually. So each user of your workspace can pin the projects that they um, maybe are referencing a lot or maybe they're currently working on. It's just, again, a quick access way to, to get to those projects. So to pin a project, you can click on it and you'll see that project will get added to our list. And if we remove it, it will disappear from our list. So easy to pin projects, but then moving forward, you'll always see those pin projects here on the left-hand side. All right, so to create a new group or a new project, you'll notice in the upper right-hand corner, we have that functionality. So let's create a new group. I'm going to call this Amy's group. We have the ability to set the visibility. So I'm going to mark mine as public. We can add a description if we would like, and we'll save that. And then we can see we've created Amy's group. Now, if I want to create a new project, I can do that by clicking on new project. That's going to take us to our uh, project creation screen. So the first thing we'll do in here is determine what type of project this is going to be. So is it going to be an API project, a style guide project, or component library project? I'm going to create an API project. And then we want to determine um, where is where's this coming from and how are we storing this project? So is it going to be a web-based project, which is what I'll create today, but we also have the ability to import an API file or we can create a project within our from our Git projects so we can pull from there as well. So however you want to create that, you can do that. We'll give our project a name. I'll name my project. Again, I have the ability to set the visibility right here. So I'm going to make mine public again. And now you have the ability to associate this project to a group. You don't have to, but you can. So I'm going to go ahead and add this project to the group that we created, Amy's group. So now as I create this project, I'm creating a brand new project, so it's going to take me directly into Studio to begin building out my project, creating articles, adding um, different artifacts um, to this project. To learn more about that, Cheryl's going to post a, a link to a training she did last month to walk through Studio. We don't have time to do that today, so I'm going to go ahead and go back to where we were. And if we go into our projects now, we'll see here's Amy's group. We have a project associated with that group. So here's our project. Um, now let's say we have some existing projects that we also want to add to this group. We have the, the ability to do that just by selecting um, one or more of the projects, how many ever you might want to move into that specific group. And then you'll notice we have some additional functionality that popped up up here. So we've got a move and a delete button. So if I want to move this project into a specific group, I can do that. I'm going to add it back into Amy's group. I can move that and you'll see that project has disappeared from the list here. But now in Amy's group, there are two associated projects and we can see both of those listed here. So that's how you can create a new group, create a new project and move existing projects into new or existing groups. So now let's take a look at teams. Um, when we look at our list of teams, we have the ability to filter by just the teams I'm associated with or all teams. We can search for a team by name. And again, we can um, click on the header to reorganize our list depending on what we're looking for. 
If we select a specific team, again, we'll get an overview panel on the right hand side, and this is going to walk us through information about this team. So here we've got our team name. If you are a part of that team, you have the ability to leave the team right from here. We can see who the admin is. We also see the projects that this team is currently associated with. If we click onto the members tab, this is where we have the ability to invite a member to this team. We also can see the list of current members and their role within that team. And then based on rights, you'll have the ability to edit the team name, description, or team avatar. So that's the information we see there. Now, as you're creating your teams, it's really up to how you want to manage your users and how they can access um, the different projects, you can create teams based on their role. So you could have a team of tech writers or DevOps. You could create teams based on um, individual teams within your organization. So Cheryl's team, um, you could create teams based on um, the guests. So if you have guests that are external to your organization that need access to um, review some of the documentation within your projects, you can create groups like that teams like that. It's really up to whatever makes the most sense for you and your organization and how you want to be able to manage your members and associate them more easily with the projects that they need access to. So to create a new team, all we have to do is in the upper right hand corner again, click on new teams. We can name our team. I'll be consistent here and call it Amy's team. You can add a description if you'd like. And then you'll always see where you stand. Um, if there's a limit on how many teams you can create within your workspace, you'll see that information here. But then you can create a new team. And now we'll see there's Amy's team that we just created. From here, we have the ability to add new members if we would like, and we'll see that here in just a minute. But before we do that, let's look at our members list. So this is where we have a list of all of the members associated to our workspace. From here, if you need to adjust someone's role, you can do that by clicking on the role and select a new role. You can see, like we've seen before, you can uh, filter your list by choosing specific workspace roles, or you can search for a member by name. You also have the ability to multi-select. So if we select a couple of these, you'll notice again, we get a couple uh, additional functionality that pops up up here. First thing is we can change roles. So if we have a list of, of members that we want to maybe make them move them from viewers to makers. We can do that by selecting all of those names and then change their role. We can select what we want their role to be. And then that would adjust their role for multiple people at one time. We also have the ability to delete members using our multi-select and approve or deny requests. So you can see here, we've got a couple uh, pending requests. So I could select both of those and either approve or deny those. Um, whatever I need to for um, my workspace. So now let's go ahead and create a, or invite a new member into our workspace. To do that, I'm going to type in an email address here. So once I've got my email address added, I'll select that. And then I'm going to choose their default role within the workspace. So I'm going to go ahead and make this user a maker. Um, and send the invite. So now an invite is being sent out to that user. And once they log in, then they'll have access to the workspace. But now I want to go back and make sure that that new member is associated with the appropriate teams. So I want to start by adding our new member, we'll call him Tom, to Amy's team. So I'm going to come in to my team, click on members, and now I can invite Tom to my workspace here. I'll make them a member and I can send that out. And I can also add that new member to an existing workspace. So let me, or to an existing team, excuse me, let me add that user also to our editors here. So I can add, Add them. Again, they'll be a member. I'll send that off. 
So now we've invited a new member to our workspace. We've added that new member to the appropriate team. And now if I come into my projects, I can look at our training Thursday, which we looked at earlier. And we know that um, the training team editors is already a part of here. So we would see once that person logs in, that new user would automatically be assigned to this group. And we could also add them to a new project, excuse me, to our new group going into our members. We can add them directly right from here as well by choosing that new Amy's team. And then anyone who's associated with Amy's team would be an editor in this new, in this project that we created. So that's how we can add members to our workspace, add them to the appropriate team, and then make sure that the right teams are associated with that project and see how um, access to each one of those projects is then assigned by following that process. So we've walked through the, the first four tabs there. So now let's look at our settings tab. So settings tab is something that you'll go into probably more regularly as you're creating and setting up your workspace and probably a little less regularly after that. But as we go through this, um, we'll go through each one of these things just so you have an understanding of what they are. And if you need to come back and, and add them into your workspace later, you can do that. So starting with our display name, um, here you have the ability to update the display name if you want to. There's two places where you would see your display name. One is along the top in your browser tab, you'll see your display name. And then also in the upper left-hand corner of your workspace, if you don't have a logo there, I have a logo right now, but if you don't have that set up yet, then you would see your display name listed up here as well. Workspace identifier, if you are using elements, you have the ability to associate that to your workspace using that identifier. You can also allow or disable join requests. So basically setting up if you want to allow um, non-users to request access to your workspace, or if you only want to be able to invite users to your workspace um, from an existing member, you can set that up here. You also have the ability to um, disable sending the Daily Digest email to guests. Daily Digest email is a high level um, list of projects that have been updated or changed. Um, not a lot of detail in it, just letting you know what projects have changed. And guests would be external to your organization who have read-only rights to specific projects. So if you don't feel that it's necessary for them to see those projects or to see that email and the list of projects that have changed, you can disable that so that email does not go out to them. Next here, we have the approved email domain. What this will do is allow anyone with, in my case, a stoplight.io email address to log into our workspace and have viewer rights. So they have the ability to log in and at least view everything within our workspace, not edit it. To add a new um, approved domain, you can just click on add. You would add that email domain. Set what you want their role to be within the workspace. So I'll leave this at viewer, click save. And now you can see we've got two email domains that would have automatic access to our workspace. I'm going to go ahead and remove this really quickly. But that's how you can really easily add uh, an approved email domain, making it easier for your users to be able to access your workspace. So below that, we've got the look and feel. Um, this really allows you to kind of change what your workspace looks and feels like. So the first thing here, um, based on your plan, you may have the ability to remove the stoplight branding. That is found in two places. One is along your browser tab along the top here, and the other is in the bottom left-hand corner of your workspace. You'll see that. So if we disable that, oh, I went too fast. Now you'll notice it's removed from our browser tab as well as the bottom of our window. And if I bring it back, and refresh my screen, we'll see that will show up again there. We also have the ability to customize our theme. So you may have noticed that my sidebar is dark. Um, yours, if you haven't made many changes, is probably white. That's because I um, set this workspace um, to the dark theme. You can try any one of the existing themes if you would like um, to change what your workspace looks like. Um, you also have the ability, if you would like to use your organizational colors, you can define those here and that way your workspace 
would have a very similar look to um, all of your other organizational websites based on the color. So you can set that up right in there. You also have the ability to update uh, or add a favicon. Um, you just use the favicon URL and you'll see that is the little icon you see on your browser tab. You also have the ability to add a logo. As you can see, I have done that in my workspace. So instead of seeing my display name, you'll see a logo up here in the left-hand corner. And finally, in the look and feel is where we have the ability to update our landing page or our home page. So initially, if you don't have anything set up, you'll see the default, which is what we see when we um, before we had authenticated and then once we had logged in. Um, this, you write your um, home screen in stoplight flavored markdown. So there's a toolbar here that can assist you with that. If you'd like, you can also use the default template to start. So you can use this as kind of a, a guide to help create things. And we can add, a make a change to this here. And then we have the ability to preview it. So we would see the changes that we make right here. Um, even if you're writing it freehand, you always have the ability to um, access your pre preview and um, see the changes there before you save it and publish it out to your homepage. So this is where you can come to um, create your homepage and welcome users into your workspace, what's new, what's coming, what's changing, stuff like that, right from your landing page here. All right, below that we have docs and settings. So this is where you can come and enable or disable the try it and mock servers, as well as disabling um, search engine indexing. If you don't want your docs to be accessible via search engine, you can um, disable that. Then we have custom domains. If you want to allow your users to access your workspace via a custom domain, you'd come in here, add your C name, and then users would be able to access um, via that vanity URL. If you set up a custom domain, you also have the ability to use Google Tag Manager for some analytics, so you can set that up in here. Um, you can set up your redirects if you need to, to make sure links don't break. Um, you can hide the sign in button, and you also have the ability with a custom domain to do some um, translation on your website. It does require a third party integration with Localize, but once you've got that set up, um, you can add your project key and then you can do some um, translation on your workspace. The last section in settings is our integrations. We use this for two things. One is to set up how we want to allow our users to authenticate into our workspace. And then secondly, we use it to set up if we're going to use um, our Git repository, we make those connections in here. So first, if we're setting up um, how we want to authenticate, you'll remember um, when we were looking at our pre-authenticated screen, there were four different options. You can see those four options right here. If you want to disable those, it's very simple. You can come in and just, we're going to disable it. So now GitLab, for instance here, would no longer show up to be able to log in, and it's not something that we would use going forward. So if I save that change, then that would disappear from that initial sign-in screen. The same applies to any one of these. Email, if I'm not going to allow people to authenticate via email, I would just disable this, and then that would no longer be an option. Um, this is also where you come if you're using single sign-on. Um, LDAP and SAML, you can configure that um, again, just by adding that and setting up your configurations down here. And then to enable um, access to your Git repositories, you would set those up as well here, following the instructions, test your settings, and then you would be able to connect your Git repos to your workspace and um, be able to um, update, make changes, and add to any of your different Git repos that you've allowed access to right from within your workspace. So there's a lot of information that I know I just covered in this settings tab. Um, as you come back to look at it, one thing to note is if you click on any of these, you'll notice in the upper right-hand corner, there's a learn more button. You can click on that and that's gonna take you out to the documentation. That's gonna walk you through specifically that, um, that item, um, provide you information, um, things to be aware of, any troubleshooting steps, all of that will be listed out here in our documentation. So it's a great place to come um, to be able to learn more about a specific item and make sure you understand how to, how to set it up and how to use it moving forward. 
So that is our settings tab. Let's move over to governance now. So this is where we would come to create um, our different, not a create, but apply our different style guides to our workspace. So we create our style guides via a project, but we can apply them then to our workspace from our governance tab. So there's two different sections when we look at default style guides. The first section would be workspace style guides. So style guides that we have specifically created um, internally for our workspace to be able to reference, those would be listed first. And then below that are the public style guides. So there are a number of different public style guides that you can choose from. Um, to learn more about any specific style guide, you can click on the preview button and that will take you out to our API style book where you can learn more about that specific style guide. You can click on each one of the rules to better understand what um, they're working on. You also have the ability to enable or disable a style guide just by selecting the enable or disable button. And you'll see the project or the style guides that are enabled are highlighted in green and have the little check mark in the upper right hand corner. So once you've got the style guides that you want to enforce selected, you can save that. And then any new project that is created within your workspace would have those style guides applied to it. Um, so again, helping to build consistency there and making sure that you're following all of your projects are following the same rules um, that will help build that consistency within your API program. Now you do have the ability to allow your admins and editors to disable the style guides that um, will default as applied to their different projects. If you want to allow that, you can. If you do not want to allow your admins and editors to disable specific style guides, you can turn that off so that all of the rules will always apply to all of your projects. Next to governance is our activities tab. Think of it as an audit log within your workspace. So you have the ability to, again, filter based on specific actions, but otherwise this will just be your running audit log. You also have um, automation next to that. And this is for if you have a Git repo associated to your workspace, you would see your web hooks listed here. So if you're um, seeing any issues or having um, getting some error messages, you can come in, learn more about that, um, resolve that issue, and then get back to working. So that is found in automation. And the last tab along the top is our billing tab. Um, this will give you a summary of your plan, um, lets you know how many members you have. So if you're getting close to that, um, how many guests you might have available, and then where you stand to your limits for teams and projects as well, based on your different plan. So that covers the tabs along the top, lots of information in there. Um, but now let's look at some of the functionality in our quick access toolbar on the left hand side. First thing I'll point out is you have a home button here, a home button here, and you, where you see your display name or your logo. Any one of those three, if you click on them, will take them back to your home page. Um, so if you get lost into something and just need to start over, any one of the three will always take you back to your home page. So that's what you can do along the top here. To the right of that, you will see a little plus button. This is the same button we saw when we were creating a project. So again, quick access, instead of having to go into projects and click on create a new project in there, you can do it right, right from your quick access button right here. Below that is your search feature. This is a word search. So if you're looking for something specific, you can type that in and it will show you the results. You can click on that and um, read through those different items. The home button we've already talked about takes us back home. The explore button, and this allows you to really explore your workspace. Um, the nice thing with this um, is it allows you to kind of explore each one of the projects associated to your workspace all in one page. So as we scroll through, we can find a project that we're interested in. We can click on the articles associated with that project, read them right from here. Um, we can even delve into the different um, endpoints and models of each one of our projects and learn more about it right from within this one page. So it makes it easier as you're um, as you're trying to learn what's in your workspace, maybe you're new to the workspace and just want to get an understanding of all the different projects that are in there. This is a great place to come just to get a feel for the different projects that are within the workspace. 
And below that, we've got our proposals. So proposals is for those who are um, have connected their workspace to their Git repo. Here you would see a list of all of the different changes to any of the different projects. So it's kind of a quick place to come again and just see everything in one place. So changes that are um, have been applied recently, are they breaking changes, just allows you to delve into each one of those individually, but kind of have a high level view of all of those changes in one place. So that's what you'll see in proposals. So below that, we've got our recent projects. So um, this does just collect kind of the last projects you've clicked on. So if you've kind of been going through a couple different projects as we have today, you can easily hop back and forth between those right by clicking on that. That will take you into um, the docs view where you can read about that project. And then you have the ability from here to either edit, share, or if you haven't already pinned this project to your, um, your pin projects tab, which takes us down to our pin projects list. These are all of the projects that we have pinned. So we've personally marked them here as something that we'll access often or something that we're currently working on. And then the last thing we have in our quick access toolbar is the ability to invite members to our workspace. So again, this is the same, same thing we saw when we were in the members tab and clicked on members and then invite members. You can do that right here from um, the quick access bar. You just type in their email address or their name, choose their default workspace role. You can add multiple members and email addresses here as well, as long as they all will have the same default role. And then you can send that invite out, but do it quickly um, right from your quick access toolbar. All right, and the last thing we're gonna look at today is our flyout menu. So here we've got some helpful information. First are, is our account settings. So here we can come in, we can update our username, we can associate an additional email address, um, to our account, we can individually um, opt out of the daily digest email. Um, we saw that in the settings tab where you could um, kind of globally um, turn off the daily digest email from going out to your guests, but your individual members also have the ability to opt out of that if they would like to. You can also update your password from here and view any connected accounts that are associated with, um, with your account. So that we can do from um, the flyout menu under account settings. Beneath that is our product documentation. This is a great place to come to learn more about your workspace. Um, you can do a simple word search. So for example, I typed in roles. Um, Cheryl talked to us earlier about the different workspace uh, roles within um, our workspace. So if I type in roles, that will take me to workspace roles. And here I can learn all about um, those different roles and what they have access to. And then you'll notice on the left-hand side, I can delve into other, um, other articles that might be associated to that just by looking through the left-hand side here and uh, navigating through the documentation that way. But our docs team has done a great job of um, making those docs accessible, keeping them up to date. And there's some really great information in there. So as you're learning more about your workspace, I encourage you to um, reference your product docs right from your flyout menu. Below that, we've got the Stoplight blog. Um, it's a great way to interact with other um, Stoplight users, as well as just generally um, in the API realm, learn more about how companies are managing their um, APIs, um, how they're building out design first philosophies within their, their API program. So it's just a great place to go to, to engage in, in the API realm. You also have access to our help articles. So if you have questions about certain things or need a little, little help trying to navigate through something, there's some helpful articles out there that you can access. You also, if you are a paid plan, have access to our support team. So you can click on contact support. That will take you to uh, the thank you for reaching out page. If you've already created your credentials to access your support portal, then all you have to do is click here and then you would log in. If you haven't yet set those up, then you'll receive an email to complete the setup of your credentials. Come back in here, click, click here to log in, and then you can log in from there. Um, below contact support are the release notes. So if you want to learn more about what has been released into um, your uh, workspace, you can read about all those changes coming up in here. 
um, easily accessible right from your flyout menu there. And then the last thing we've got here is our roadmap. So this allows you to come in and see what's coming. Um, you also have the ability to submit a feature request. So if you have an idea for something that would be super useful in your workspace, you can come out here and do that right from within your workspace itself. So that wraps up um, the tour of um, our workspace and how we can manage our projects, manage our teams, manage our members, um, set up the look and feel and um, our um, integrations within our workspace, as well as just kind of managing the day-to-day -day functionality of our workspace. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Cheryl to wrap up. Thank you, Amy. So as a reminder, we did post some of those uh, links to our documentation in the chat window. So if you have not done so, please go ahead and uh, copy those, bookmark them, and, and uh, you can do that as I wrap up. Uh, I'd like to quickly review the stoplight subscription plan options for you. So you can leverage a selection of software as a service subscription options to uh, the stoplight fully hosted version for, of your, for your API design, mocking and documentation, as well as governance building blocks. With stoplight's basic plan, you can begin to uh, work with interactive documentation and mocking servers, and it allows you to collaborate with up to three users. Moving up to the Stoplight Starter Plan, your subscription includes five users who can collaborate when on up to 10 projects, and it unlocks an approved email domain and customer uh, the custom workspace domain features within your workspace. And you also have the ability to add user licenses as needed. By leveling up to the Stoplight Professional Plan, your subscription includes 10 users and 100 projects, along with 20 teams and 50 guests users. Again, you can purchase additional user licenses as needed. And the external guest component capability have given you the ability to invite users that are external to your organization. And um, you can allow them to see your stoplight projects and to view your internal API design specifications and documentation articles from behind an authenticated session. The professional plan also unlocks uh, single sign-on options, as well as using um, SAML or LDAP in that in the single sign-on components. Additional Git provider options, such as Git Enterprise or Azure DevOps Server. Also, custom domain features within your workspace, which allow you to use your host name as your uh, AP, Stoplight a, a hosted API designs and documentation. And you will have access to the discussions feature that will help you uh, in collaboration with the designing of your APIs. Lastly, with uh, Stoplight's Enterprise Subscription Plan, that plan includes 25 users, unlimited projects, unlimited external guests, and unlimited teams. You also gain the ability to access volume licensing discount when uh, purchasing additional user licenses. And you have additional accounts involving um, invoicing uh, flexibility as well as custom pay terms. And finally, you have the uh, enhanced onboarding and training engagements with your customer success team and uh, enhanced priority with your support cases. So as a reminder, all of the questions that are posted in the QA session will be added to our Discord community in the Connect and Discuss forum with the, <clears throat> excuse me, the training tag. And you'll be able to see all the submitted questions and their answers there shortly. We are posting that Discord link in our chat so you're able to access that. And so this wraps up the uh, Thursday training session for today. Be sure to mark your calendars for the next training session from your customer success team, which is going to be on August 10th. The, we have a live training scheduled typically for the second Thursday of each month. But for the months of June and July, our fantastic marketing team will be presenting some webinars so you can stay tuned for more details. Be sure to check out our Learn with Stoplight webinar playlist for recordings of all of our previous Stoplight training sessions. And these can be found in YouTube by searching Learn with Stoplight webinars. You can also search the how-to playlist for short trainings. Those will help you uh, learn a little bit more about some specific function capabilities. 
And we're going to stay on for another minute or so to allow for time for any additional questions and answers. And at, at, with that, I guess we thank you and we have a wonderful day. Thank you.